Hello everyone, my name is Christian Steinmetz and I'm a PhD student at Queen Mary University of London. Today I want to talk to you about our ICAS paper, Direct Design of Biquad Filter Cascades with Deep Learning by Sampling Random Polynomials. And this is work alongside my collaborators listed here on the screen. So first, let's just talk a little bit about infinite impulse response filters and biquadratic filters. So here you can see the transfer function of an nth order infinite impulse response filter. And in practice, we make some general assumptions uh, when implementing these filters in many cases. For example, we assume that these numerator and denominator coefficients are real numbers. And additionally, to facilitate numerical stability, the filters are often implemented as a cascade of k second order biquad filter sections. That we can see that here in the bottom transfer function, where we can simply have k sections, where each of them is simply a second order filter, and we can compute the overall response of the filter by taking the prog product of their magnitude response. So what are we aiming to solve in this problem with regards to filter design? So first, let's just talk about how you measure the response of a filter. So if you've ever used any sort of filter design tool, for example, in MATLAB, you may be familiar with the freak z function, which is a function that, given some filter coefficients, allows us to compute the magnitude response of some filter. And this lets us know what the filter will do, you know, across frequency when we apply it to some signal. And this is pretty trivial. And if we want to design a filter, you may also be very familiar with different filter design prototypes, which if we have a filter with some specification, for example, it should reject high frequencies. We would use a low pass filter for that with a certain cutoff frequency, and we can analytically compute the filter coefficients following existing prototype designs with things like Butterworth, Chebyshev, and many other approaches. But there's a problem when what you want to design is a filter that has an arbitrary magnitude response. And in this case, approaches that have to go from this arbitrary magnitude response to the filter coefficients is actually a much harder problem. And there's been a lot of research in this area over the last 30 or more years in signal processing to say, how can we build a system that can do this task? And that's what we aim to look at in this work. So there are many existing approaches, as I said, to design a filter response with an, uh, that has an arbitrary response. And traditional approaches include things like the modified Yule Walker approach, gradient-based optimization, least squares approaches, genetic algorithms, and many other approaches. The problem is that often these approaches are either too slow because they require many iterations or complex calculations like matrix inverses, or they often may be not accurate enough if they're run for very few iterations. And this can be a problem when we want to have this kind of filter design happening in real time or on embedded systems or other applications um, where speed and accuracy are both important. So recently there's actually been interest in deep learning approaches for filter design. And so far people have looked at things like taking magnitude response um, as input and estimate the parameters of a parametric EQ to match that response, as well as a graphic EQ. And these approaches provide super useful tools for audio engineers, since the neural network will produce a human interpretable you know, parameterization of these um, EQs that match that response, so they can adjust it and see what it's doing. But in many cases, we don't actually care about the underlying parameterization. We just want a filter that will match our arbitrary magnitude response as close as possible. And so far, there's not been work on arbitrary filter design in the context of deep learning, which is what we aim to look at here. So our proposed method looks something like this. We start with a magnitude response that we want for our filter to achieve. We pass that as input to our neural network, which we call IIRnet, which then will estimate a set of filter coefficients that hopefully achieves that same magnitude response. And we can view this in some sense as using a neural network to learn this mapping or approximation of this mapping from the magnitude domain to the filter coefficient domain. And this provides a number of unique benefits. For example, it can be very fast since our approach just uses a forward pass with some matrix operations, no online optimization after training during inference, and there's no hyperparameter tweaking and we can potentially can be very accurate given a big enough model and train for long enough is the, is the goal. And so this sets us up very nicely to potentially provide a deep learning approach for this problem. But as with any deep learning approach, we need a way to train the model with some data. And 
we can view this in a certain a few different ways. For example, um, one thing we may want is some way to generate random filters that in some sense have a uniform distribution in the magnitude space, which means that we just have a uniform distribution in the input space of our neural network so that given any type of input from the user, we would have seen something like that during training. Another view could be that we want to generate filters randomly that cover at least the space of real world filters. So filters that people would actually design for some practical use cases. But it turns out that both of these are actually quite difficult and non-trivial to answer. And so we devoted a significant portion of our work actually looking into this problem of generating the training data that would generalize to actual real-world applications. And to do that, we looked at a lot of the literature in random polynomials and to look at how we could gain some insights into generation of random filters that would cover a wide variety of different behaviors. And these random polynomials, their behavior essentially drives the behavior that we see in infinite impulse response filters, since these filters transfer function is really just the um, division of one polynomial by another. And so in these plots here, you can see the distribution of um, what would become poles and zeros in our um, filters when sampling with these different filter methods. And you can see that all of them produce a diverse result distribution of poles and zeros, which corresponds to diverse behavior in the magnitude response domain. So now back to the architecture real quick before we get into the experiments that we ran, just to provide a few more insights into what's happening there. So as I said before, our neural network architecture is fairly straightforward where it's just composed of a, a basic MLP that is composed of linear layers, layer norm, and a leaky ReLU activation function with a few layers stacked like that. And the result is actually that at the output of the network, instead of predicting the numerator and denominator coefficients directly, we actually predict a pole and zero for every second order section, and we fix the number of second order sections at training. Then given each of those poles and zeros, we can compute the magnitude response for each, and then compute the overall magnitude response as the product of those sub by quad section responses, and then compute you know, some error between the target and our estimated response. But digging a little bit more into the details of this aspect, you can see that we can represent the transfer function as a function of these poles and zeros. And in this case, we can also um, go one step further with this parameterization, which is very helpful, which is to apply these specialized activation functions, which restrict the range of the poles and zeros, essentially keeping them both inside the unit circle with space as well to ensure that they never touch um, the edge or get too close where um, stability may become an issue. But yes, this approach then uh, ensures both stability and minimum phase filters in our design, which is a nice result of this parameterization of the transfer functions. But then the next step, we have to measure the response of those second order sections in order to compute the loss. And one way to do this would simply be to compute the impulse response of each of the filters in the time domain. But as you can see from this function, we would have to do some recursion in time. And we really would like to avoid that. So instead, we use this uh, approach that's simpler to the frequency sampling method. And in this case, we simply take the DFT of the numerator and denominator coefficients and divide them to get an approximation of the response of the filter at a set of linearly spaced frequencies um, that are given by the DFT. And we can implement this on GPU hardware very efficiently with the FFT. And as we increase the zero padding that we apply to the numerator and denominator coefficients, we get closer and closer to the actual response of this filter, um, you know, given the real time domain uh, recursion. And this gives us a huge benefit beyond just being able to um, run it on the GPU efficiently, but also that we can avoid backpropagation through time and approximate this response over any number of linearly spaced frequencies that we desire. And after we've estimated those magnitude responses, we simply use a very simple uh, loss function, like the mean squared error here of the log of both the estimated and the target responses. So now on to the experiments that we ran to validate our approach and to understand how our approach generalized to real world use cases. So we ran three different experiments. The first was focused on the most important question of which of these which of these filter families would produce a distribution of random filters that was useful for our real world applications as well as generalizing across the different filter families. We also looked at the impact of model size on both the performance of the model um, with regards to the accuracy and the speed, as in many cases we want kind of the fastest model um, to do this task as possible. And we also looked at the filter order and seeing how does training on a certain order generalize or not to different filter orders, higher and lower.
And here are just some of the training details, but I encourage you to check out the paper as well as the code that we open source for more details on this. But the main thing of note is that all of the models were trained for the same number of iterations, and they all saw the same 10 million random filters for each filter order that we tried. So now onto the evaluation and results of these experiments. We, in order to form our evaluation, we considered three different uh, data sets. First, we created a data set of our random polynomials from the different families that I introduced earlier. We also looked at real measured guitar cabinet impulse responses, as well as measured HRTFs. And we applied some smoothing to those uh, responses and tried an IR filter to match those originally FIR filter responses. So in the case of the filter family experiments, we trained one model trained on each of the different filter families, as well as one model that was trained on all of the different filter families. And then we evaluated each of those models on this different subsets of those filter families. And as evidenced by the diagonal here in this uh, plot, you can see that training on the filter family produces the best uh, or lowest error on that filter family during inference time. But interestingly, the major takeaway that we found was that actually training with all of the filter families at the same time produced the best error on average across all of the different data sets that we looked at across all the polynomial families, as well as the HRTF and guitar cabinets. Interestingly, the U Walker approach performed very well in the case of the HRTFs outperforming all the other approaches, but it performed far worse on many of the polynomial families, indicating that its generalization to very extreme or difficult filters may be not as good as the um, approach of IRNet. Now, with regards to model size and the speed of the models, we trained a large number of different uh, sized versions of IRNet, all the way from 64 hidden dimensions up to 4,096 hidden dimensions with a model with over 20 million parameters. And as you would expect, as we increased the model size, we saw that the performance increased as well, lowering the overall uh, mean squared error. But what we found was that even our largest model with 20 million parameters, which achieved um, very good reconstruction error, was even faster than modified Yule Walker. So even our largest model was still faster. And we could go make the model even faster by reducing the size at some cost of uh, performance as shown here. And in our last experiment, we looked at the filter order and how it impacted um, generalization to different filter orders. So in this case, we train one model with only on filters of a certain order from 4 to 64. Then during evaluation, we test each of these models on filters from different orders and the same that, during training. And interestingly, we find here is that our 30 second model order performs best across all orders during inference, even ones higher than it saw, in this case, 64 during training than the model that was actually trained the 64th order filters. And th while this is somewhat surprising, we hypothesized that this happened because we found difficulty in training stably anything higher than a 32nd order um, model. So the 64th order model, even though it saw these higher order filters, it had more difficulty in training stably, which led to worse performance. And so this kind of does show some good results that even training at a fixed order means that we can go higher or lower and still get decent performance, although maybe not as good at as training at that order. And so as I wrap up here, I just want to talk about some of the limitations of our approach and how they could lead into future work in this area. So as I just mentioned, the one limitation is that we always estimate a filter the same order that we fixed during training. So even though we can get low error on filters that are lower order than the model was trained on, you may not want to implement a 30 second order filter if you don't need it. So in this case, to adjust to any number of filter orders, you'd have to train a new model for each order that you want to generate for. Um, future approaches could incorporate the filter order as a parameter of the network and could potentially generate arbitrary order filters, which could be a future uh, direction. The other uh, limitation is that we only consider magnitude in the design constraints here, but phase could also be factored in relatively easily. We also have the inability to apply specific design constraints to the process, which could be another extension. Also hybrid approaches in which we use IRNet to first initialize some gradient-based optimization approach could also reduce the number of iterations those approaches need while retaining high accuracy in some applications. And as I mentioned, instability with, with filter orders greater than uh, 32 is another thing to investigate to further extend this work. But to summarize, our major contribution of our work is that we we to summarize, the major contribution of our work is that we propose a fast and accurate method to estimate realistic recursive filter responses with arbitrary magnitude, 
using only synthetic random filters from these random polynomial families. So we don't have to use any real training data in order to generalize to these real use cases like the Qatar cabinet and HRTF, which is the ultimate result that we wanted. And that concludes the, this talk, and thanks so much for um, joining. We, the preprint and the paper are available on Archive, along with the code on GitHub if you want to check it out. We also have a Colab notebook with the pre-trained models, which you can design your own filters right there in Colab for your application. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out via email. Thank you so much.